Hello everyone, OG Rose here, and today we're having another wonderful interview with the one and only Bernard Hankins, uh, the poet, philosopher, teacher, musician, you name it, he does it. Recently, Mr. Hankins was on a panel discussion about the role of arts and healing at the farmhouse in Charlottesville, Virginia, with, for the Breath in the Clay, which their podcast is called uh, Makers and Mystics. And we just thought today we'd have a conversation about that podcast and the, the, the topic at hand because it's so pressing and it's so important. Uh, so, Mr. Hankins, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Absolutely. What, what were some of the ideas you brought to the table during the discussion? Well, the overall theme of the night was art as healing. Mm. And so on the panel, well, first, you know, they interviewed Lawrence Stone Street, who is one of the founders of the Farmhouse ah. Arts Organization in Charlottesville. You can look them up. Um, and then Latasha Struthers did spoken word poetry. Oh, wonderful. And then there was oh, a panel of four people, including myself, uh, Dr. McDonald. I can't mm. remember exactly his practice, but he has very interesting you know, insights into medicine. And then uh, Nadine, I can't remember her last name, uh, but she's at UVA getting her PhD mm. in neuroscience and mm. something else. I think she, I talked to her. She's been there five years, so she's going really? on eight years. So. Wow. And then you have Brendan Jameson, who, oh, yes. you know, you also know, musician Absolutely. in town. So, you know, four different perspectives on what it was. Uh, healing, you know, how are we as artists are using art to heal. heal. Mm. Um, so I told them, you know, I work in school right now, mm. public school. Albemarle? Yeah, Albemarle High School. Mm. So I told, uh, my, my pr first point of view was, you know, I'm a philosopher, mm. so I always pose the deep questions right i don't let uh people get o get away with these surface level responses <laughs> especially well, we love you <laughs> especially you know for teenagers who are forming their identities and asking questions right. like what does it mean to be a man what does it mean to be a woman what does it mean to be a human right um i think you know all that kind of stuff can get glossed over and, that, oh, yeah. and people are really asking those questions right and so i told them one way in which i'm bringing healing is by you know, penetrating into the depths where people are afraid to go. Mm, mm, mm. Oh no! I, and it also, I think, when they're teenagers, if you give the, if you do shallow answers, then it creates the impression that shallow answers are good enough. Uh, and shallow answers are also fragile answers. When you actually go through life, you'll find that they don't stand up. So I think going deep is also robust. Is how you give people strength and even to use um, the Talib term, anti-fragile, where they actually grow when they encounter clash and fragility situations. Well, well that's wonderful. Well, what were some of the main ideas, would you say, when, when it came to <laughs> art as healing that you thought was important for people to understand that went deep? Um, well, one topic that we I wanted to go deeper into, mm. uh, Stephen Roach, who runs the podcast, he started off with this idea of how does justice and beauty kind of come together. Come together. Yes. And so he was. He read something that he had written, and I, it sparked me to respond to him with something I had come up with. Because he he did this interesting thing where he said the word fair, as in like beauty, yeah, also means fair, as in to be fair. And right. Justice. I was like, oh, I never made that connection, but I had made the connection of why is it when you restore an art painting, it's called restoration. restoration. You yeah. know, to restore something to its original thing mm. um, is seen as what, that's what justice is. When mm. some, something is stolen from someone, you pay it to back. To restore what you, was you broke. Know, it's restoration, ah. restitution. Right. So I just thought it was interesting that it's also said of paintings, which is to say there's something about the aesthetic of painting mm. where you use that word, which means to bring it back to its original state. Interesting. You know, its true state, its thing that everybody praised it for. Interesting. So there is some link there between something looking beautiful. Mm. All, you know, something just that also has to look, a, it's like an yeah, aesthetic. It's, aesthetic it's not just, it. it's not just paying someone back. Right. You know, I don't, I don't think we think about that, but there's just something about that looks right. Ah, yeah. You know, that just yeah. looks right. good. Or like, you know, when people say of a girl, like, you know, that dress doesn't do you justice. Ah, ah. They're saying you look so good, <laughs> the dress should be complimenting it your beauty be or accentuating. Interesting. But that dress doesn't even come close to looking as beautiful as you. So that was something I wanted to go deeper into. But, but I did take it um, to the next level of saying, you know, I think there is definitely a connection between aesthetic and healing hmm. and that art creativity has to precede any truth telling comedians mm. tell jokes mm. to slip the truth in right so i told him my wordplay was you know art is an aesthetic 
mm. that is an anesthetic. Uh, uh, Art is an aesthetic that acts as anesthetics or anesthesia. Absolutely. And so it's the idea that anytime you want to talk to somebody about something that's hard, racism, sexism, right, right. Any, any ism, you have to precede them with something beautiful or kind or empathy, empathetic oh, yeah. or gracious. Absolutely. Otherwise, they won't receive it. Oh, I think we see that because people are trying to make politics go for go ahead, be what makes me, and it doesn't. It makes it, it makes it worse. You know, politics can never play the role of being the anesthetic that you're describing. That art can, because politics, while well, po- art makes people put their defenses down, while politics makes people put their defenses up. Right. But, of course, since they don't teach art in school, the only option is for people to go in the political direction. Um, well, and, and it would also seem that that's, that's, that's interesting is this kind of connection between just and beauty. There's a sense that if a society is just, there are certain things you would see that right. you would not see, uh, that, that, you would, that you would see in a just society that you wouldn't see in an unjust society. You wouldn't see people being taken advantage of. You wouldn't see people in, uh, you know, super rich uh, houses while everyone around them is living in cardboard boxes. There would be something about the very aesthetics, the very visuals of seeing that, of which would be, uh, there would be something, it, uh, it wouldn't look right, it would be beautiful to you. It, it's hard to imagine someone finding a painting beautiful of someone living in a, you know, a fancy mansion surrounded by people suffering in cardboard boxes around them. Right. Even if it's a beautifully done painting, the subject itself would force you not to see the work as beautiful. Uh, so that, that's that's quite interesting on, on that. Another point I brought up, I think I, uh, I was on the same theme. I either read in a Rob Bell book or John Elridge, I can't remember. But it was after, I think it was after World War II, there was like an infirmary and his nurse was asking one of the soldiers, like, can I get you anything? Mm. And he responded, can you just stand there and put on some lipstick while I watch? Uh, and so then somehow some order of some other supplies was supposed to come in, but someone on purpose or by accident in quotes, like made it. So all these boxes of lipstick showed up mm. so that, you know, soldiers could see nurses, you know, put it on lipstick. Mm. So I was just making the point. There's something about if you're coming from seeing death, destruction, your friend, brother killed every day just to see some aesthetic, pleasant right. image in front of you is like it was necessary it's not just like oh he wants to look at a woman it's like i need to see something beautiful yeah and that reminds me i guess it was roger scruton's book on beauty talks about when you walk into a room i mean you don't want to be obsessed with cleanliness i think people make cleanliness like this religion and it's a terrible thing but there's something about walking into a room and people just being things being set right there's a certain like the right. couch is where it's supposed to be. there's a sort of experience of oh this room is pleasant because things are it, it's, are, are set right, like setting a table. I mean, certainly you shouldn't make a religion of setting a table, but when you see a table set, there's something where you go, oh, that's not, it looks nice, it looks yeah. right. And so what, you know, I think with the notion of justice, like likewise when you walk into a society and you see people treating one another in certain ways, it's like seeing a set table, it's like, oh, this looks right. Yeah. And it's hard to imagine, it would be an interesting thought experiment, to imagine a, on, on what grounds would you find an unjust society Beautiful. I mean, you could only you could only do that when like the justice is breaking through and helping someone. You would be ah. It's like, can you even experience beauty in an unjust society on unjust terms, or would it have to be like you're saying, like we're saying, like secret agent kind of coming into enemy lines, coming behind the end, like that's numbing it. It's almost as if you can't even have an experience of 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 justice unless it does have this sort of beautiful quality to it. It almost seems impossible to do. Well, even the language you're using, I don't know if he used that language and that's why you're using it, but like you say, to set a table. Yeah. But what do people say? Like, oh, I need to set, set things, things right. right. To set them right, you exactly. Know? So, it's, I mean, to me, I'm fascinated with the wordplay, obviously, of how many things cross over between these genres like justice and art. And you're like, oh, right, we do use that language. And, mm. well, you know, I talk, I talk a lot about this in a different topic where I say, you know, she's drop dead gorgeous. If looks could kill, breath take, uh, you know, that whole thing about death and beauty. Right, right. That's a great you know, thought. Yeah. So yeah. there's, you know, it's just interesting that things we sort of intuitively know, like you're saying, you walk down the street, you see someone who's dressed a certain way. You go like, oh, he needs to be dressed in a three piece. It's like all yeah. the movies show the montage. Like right, right. You know, he's homeless and then he's in a business suit. Right. Now, I mean, I think it's like a shallow version of it, obviously. Sure, but at sure. least people, people at least intuitively get what you're saying about the idea of you look at something and you know that's just not right that's correct for a person to be sitting there 
with a certain look, and then you see someone walking past them, and they look very clean. That's cut. right. It's a look. That yeah. be, like there's a response. To, there's almost a sense in which, when justice happens, there's a change in clothing. There's a right. change in location. There's a change of how things look that accompany justice. It's it's kind of hard to think of a transition from unjust to justice without there also being a transition in clothing, how it looks, appearances, action, like the right. movement itself would necessarily it would seem necessarily right. have to bring with it these uh, these changes. Well, what I didn't really get to go in depth into, which is you know my whole self worth, identity, mm, purpose, meaning, right, fourfold philosophy, right, right, right. that I bring everything back to no matter what. I That's got to excellent. get into it a little bit at the post Q and A. Right. But ideally, for anyone, artist or non artist, the number one thing that needs to be healed is your sense of self worth. Right. Right. And so, obviously, if you look at someone who's on the street. Even if you put them in a nice, even if you put them in a nice suit, that doesn't mean they're going to automatically have a sense of confidence. Right. Like people right. say, oh, you dress, you dress well, you feel good, you dress good, look good, feel sure, good. I'm right, like, right. so sometimes maybe yeah, like right. for the night, like oh, right. you're taking your wife out. She's like, oh yeah, I felt good in my gown. Right, but right. if she has overall self worth issues, it's sure, not going to be like sure. the next day. She's like, well, honey, all our marriage issues are fixed. <laughs> you know, because we went out and you put on a, I put on a sequence a dress. That's good. <laughs> so obviously there is something to be said about how you look does or can affect how you right, feel. But right. obviously you need to feel good about yourself and that will eventually change how you look. So if, if you, you know, people always use that analogy of like, oh man, you know, humans, we're, we kind of have amnesia. We bumped our head. We don't know our true worth. Right. We don't know we're made in God's image. Right. And then somebody comes up to us and is like, hey, you know you're like a, you're supposed to be playing at Carnegie Hall tonight and you're like what? And it's like no I'm just like I'm a, you know that was, that's some, I don't know if it's a true story but somebody said like some guy came up to a guy on the bench like where have you been? He's like what are you talking about? He's like you're supposed to be playing at Carnegie Hall in 15 minutes. Like the guy had bumped his head and had amnesia. Wow. Because like he didn't know who he was. So they people use that I've heard preachers use that to explain us as humans. Like we bumped our head we don't know who yeah, we are. Right, so right. we look at our outside self and we're like yeah you know I guess I'm homeless or I'm not worth anything. Mm. So I feel like once you restore an inner sense of self-worth, the external self-worth will begin to express itself. Right. If, you, if someone came up to you and told you, you're actually from royalty, right. you would all of a sudden look at your clothes like, what I, what am I doing with this on then? Right. Like right. you would have an instant paradigm shift right. of like, as royalty, I should look Carry like royalty. and act and do certain things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and it, it would also, I mean, to that, maybe it would seem as if, you know, maybe dressing a certain way can help you feel. But if you have self worth there, perhaps dressing certain ways can bring it out. But it wouldn't seem that putting on the nice suit will will create self worth that's not already there. It has to. It can maybe perhaps bring out or bring to the forefront and, and help formulate. But it doesn't right. seem like it can make something out of nothing. Might be the right way to look at it. I mean, traditionally, there's um, I guess from Aristotle the notion of the telos in that like uh, the the. the Everything has a certain purpose, the final calls that it's heading toward, in that the, the, the truth of a thing is that of which makes it head toward that cause. And so the, the thing that they fit together, you know, like a flute, the final cause of a flute is to make music. So when yeah. the flute is making music, it is therefore being its true self. And then also, uh, for Aristotle, the justice of a society is tied to the point of a society. You know, what, what is it that the society exists to do? And when it achieves that, that telos, um, it is going to be a, a true society. It will be a just society. And then for Aristotle, it will also thus be a beautiful society because the form is matching what he called the accident. It's the, 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 um, the form of the thing and the contingencies of the thing are lining up. Therefore, it's beautiful because right. it's in its full self. Uh, and then it was also good. Because it was necessary, you know, just as necessarily good. And so this kind of idea of the final cause, the purpose of things, was the point at which the good, the truthful, the beautiful, and the just all came together. And some, some would even say that justice is, the, um, is when the true, is the point at which the true, the beautiful, and the good meet. Um, and then you could say the good is where they meet. You know, you can right. use those interchangeably in different ways. If that, assuming there's some truth to that, um, what do you think, uh, if I was to say, what is the purpose of art in society? What, what is its role? And, and how does it maybe move society toward that purpose in a manner to bring about the just, the good, the true, and the beautiful? Um, I guess, you know, the other thing I kind of really wanted to get into 
Uh, there was only 30 minutes, so right. we, didn't, we didn't really get to get really into right, it, even right, though we have yeah. the caliber of people who are capable of right, it. Right, right. Uh, I wanted to bring up this idea of, you know, art right now is sort of vaccination. Mm. And really, it should be medication. Or, no, mm. sorry. It's, art right now is seen as medication, and really, it should be seen as vaccination. Mm. Mm. So rather than prescribe medicine post trauma, like, oh man, we had these people invade our city, and now, you know, there's hate and there's racism. Right. You know, let's let's now process through right. the poetry. It's like, yeah, those things are needed because there sure, are times where you sure. just get sick. Yeah, absolutely. Like you go to the doctor, the doctor's like, you need to take this medicine because right. you're sick. I'm not denying that, but what I'm saying is there needs to be a, you know, a, pre- a thought, a mindset of preventing trauma exactly. yes. and you yes. know unhealthy things. So it's all art seems so reactive in society. Right. I'm not saying that just because you have art in a society, there's never going to be problems. Sure. But sure. what I'm saying is, if you prescribe art in classrooms, philosophically, um, how you get people to think, how you get people to care, as I talk about in my you know TEDx talk, imagination leads to empathy. Right. Reading stories from different people's points of view, oh, putting yeah. your mind Absolutely. in the... Putting your shoes, putting your feet in someone's shoes of a woman, someone different than you, different country. Like, you start to cultivate a culture of thoughtful people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that then we can cut off some of these tragic and traumatic events that will happen. So you don't have neo-Nazis even being formed. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like, if you have someone who's a... Rather than, like, oh, man, this neo-Nazi goes to prison, has this, you know, experience where he reads a book... And he encounters someone, you know, like with American, American History, History X. X. Yeah. Like, has an encounter with someone. Like, oh, wow, this person is so different. I'll, I know it now after I've encountered yeah, them. It's right. like, encounter that first. Right, right, right. I, I, I would guess that you'd be less likely to then judge those kind of people and then join a neo-Nazi, you know, group. Oh, yeah. And, there, you know, as a little side point, there's un- unfortunately seems to be incentive in society for those sort of um, those sort of stories. Because if the Nazis never show up, there's no story. You know, right. if the Nazis go in art and they never form, there's no dramatic story about them coming in and, and people being changed. So right. there's almost like an incentive structure to be reactionary so that you have a news to talk about. And then if people aren't creating their own purposes and they're not doing their own arts, then they kind of need that drama in order to have a sense of going on. Uh, but no, this notion of, yes, yeah, society, it's kind of funny because society has this tension where it creates scripts for people so that they know what to do, you know, get, you know, have go to school, get married, blah, blah, blah. And those scripts provide some structure. But then at the same time, if there's just the scripts, then it can never stop anything. It's just people following the motions that are there. And so, like, art has this role in society where while society provides the structure, art doesn't let society just be the structure because that's when people become thoughtless, that's when they, they're not deep, and that's when they get sucked up into these radical problems. And, and then also society doesn't prevent them, only reacts to them. And so there's this interesting sort of um, art always has to be pulling society out of its scripts, while at the same time society has to be pulling art into itself so that art has structure and it's not just pure organic. Uh, pure organic. Well, I mean, one of my favorite moments is I was download the audio version of like the 9-11 commission report. Mm. And the guy who starts off saying like, okay, this is we spent all this time investigating what took place mm. you know leading up to 9-11 the day of mm. and then post and the f- one of the first few things he said he's like we had a failure of this we had a failure of that and I can't even remember those two but the last thing he said he said the thing that we had most of was a failure of imagination wow yeah so just this wow. idea that our country is so shaped to be people who just pre- just or predict things predict mm. things but not in the in the imaginative right. foreshadowing way, right. but just like it's predictable. Right. Like people think everything is like mathematically formulaic. Oh, right. well, 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 if we have the if we have the right formula, we have the right sequence, we can chart and graph that, and we'll know what's going to happen. Like you know, business people on Shark Tank. Oh, we project we're going to make ten million dollars next year. Like <laughs> really? Like I, I guess yeah, right. you could maybe. It's a projection, you know. Right. But what is imagination? Projection. Mm. projecting like i said empathy is projecting an imaginative you know your subjective self into someone else right so you know that that idea that we couldn't imagine something like a 9-11 until it happened right now it's in our consciousness it's pierced our consciousness so now we can at least imagine that Mm. and now we're a little more like okay we imagine that okay yeah something else could happen and that makes me think you know when we have the the um the, the, the overall topic as art as healing 
You almost can get almost <coughs> even get into imagination as healing, and then right. ask the question: Is healing possible without imagination? Right. Because in a sense, it's not. Because if you're wounded, and you can't imagine an alternative, right. then you're stuck in being wounded. So it would almost seem as if healing is not even possible without imagination, and that the arts stimulate imagination, that they embody imagination. But really, in, in the same as you on your your TED talk, is that imagination seems to really just be the the um, kind of the elixir, the magical elixir for so many right. problems. Well, I mean, I had we when we did a talk a few times ago, I had wanted to bring up this, you know imaging versus imagining Interesting. you know just the little few letter yeah, different yeah, change yeah, yeah, imaging yeah. versus imagining so your logical part of your brain that's what it does it images it's like a you know a camera right it sees a tree takes a picture okay remember that next time for tree it sees a car okay remember car it sees a cat it remembers cat it recalls it recollects so that's great if all you ever do is encounter that same tree, that same mm -hmm. car, the same mm -hmm. cat, because all your brain has to do is say, okay, we remember this, recall, okay, we got it. Right. Like, I know what to do, not dangerous. Right. However, that doesn't work if you're trying to invent new things and create culture. Right. That works, sure, like if you're in a dangerous situation, you right. just need to know that's a poisonous snake, thank you, brain, I'm out. Right. You know, I'm out of right. here. Right. But if you're saying, okay, how do I invent the new, uh, new next new iPhone, next new business, you can't just look at the iPhone that is in your brain go oh yes that is an iPhone right because your brain is just going to stay stuck looking at that image right, right it takes the imagination to go from imaging to imagining mm. so that you can then insert that newness that you, you new unique thing that makes it what it wasn't before it almost could you say you know imaging is to be able to go x equals x imagining <laughs> is able to go x to y you know right. you go you're able to look at x and see y where, yeah, if people, if they don't have imagination, then all they can do is process what is presented to them. They can't move beyond it. So then when it comes to if you're wounded, I mean, all you can do is say, I am wounded. I am hurt. Right. There is hurt. And I think that, I mean, it makes me think of two things. It makes me think, well, particularly, you know, I have this one poem that kind of parallels the uh, African narrative of slavery and then like the... Jewish narrative of the Holocaust. Oh, yes, that's a good one. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. how the same Nuremberg laws, you know, Jews can't swim here and, you know, blacks can't swim here, Jim Crow uh, laws. There's like a lot of parallels. Interesting. Yes, but the reason right. I, th I think about that is uh, imagine people in those traumatic situations, if they had only their logic to look at a situation, mm. then there's obviously going to be a great deal of hopelessness. Because mm. if you wake up every day and you see all I can ever see is chains or all I can see is, you know, concentration camp then obviously you have nothing to look forward to. And that's what Viktor Frankl talks yeah. about in his book, you know, like yeah. what makes a Search person right. be able to hold on, you know, and people coming up with games, coming up with jokes, yeah, 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 having yeah. some sense of, uh, like, I think he told a story with some guy, every day they would tell, sto friends would tell stories to one another. Yeah, that's and the, man, man search for me. Yeah, and yeah, the guy yeah, said yeah. something like, he says, you know, now when they dip down into the soup, we hope to get a little pee. Yeah. You know, because yeah. all it is is water. He says, I imagine when we get out of here, I'll be at your house for dinner. And I'll be like, when you dip down in the ladle, you know, ladle, <laughs> can you make sure to give me a few peas? So they're up here joking right. about their situation now because right. that's the only thing that's going to keep them sane. Now people think, oh, that's, how could you be, how could you think it would be comedic and such cruel right, but, but put to, to those people, it's like, they're like, how can I not? Well, and I think that's very important because, you know, I was thinking as you were talking on how today there would almost be a sense if you're using your imagination on your wounds to healing, people would go, oh, you're in denial, right. face reality. And it's almost because we're so artistically illiterate, to use your term, we're imag imaginatively illiterate, that the only way we can think of considering why is as denial, as, right. you know, not facing reality. And, and that we have all these negative terms for, like, like you say, like, how can you tell jokes in the middle of the Holocaust? This is the Holocaust. You're supposed to, like, you know, be depressed until you commit suicide. I mean, that's not what you want, but that's ultimately what the logic of people leads to. If you're not going to cling to your humanity and find whatever mechanisms you can to cling that, to that humanity, then, then what is there but to stay in the womb? <coughs> well, I think one of the, like, biggest examples I think of is in America is hip-hop. Mm. Like, imagine all, most of the rappers whose albums that you listen to are telling stories about where they came from. Now, whether uh, it's, whether these, some of these rappers are like actually lived that life or not, the concept behind it remains, which is if you grow up in a certain environment and all you ever see is like drugs, 
you know, right, dilapidated right, buildings, right. cracked. Like if all you ever see is X. certain circumstances and you have no ability to project yourself above oh, and right. out yeah. to tr- see yourself as transcending that, then you will only end up in that. Now, so I guess that's the difference. Some people just end up in that. They say, oh, I see the drug dealer. I can become a drug dealer. Mm. Some people, though, at least, at least you can say, well, they took the drug dealer to the storyteller level. Uh, like, even though you may not agree with the content, sure, sure. They, they, they took the idea of what they saw the drug dealer doing, <clears throat> wrote it down in a narrative, put it to a beat, huh. packaged it as a right. whole album, and they, they catapulted themselves out of that, saying, I'm not going to get actually in that lifestyle, right, right, but I'm going right. to sort of use that lifestyle as an energy to remove myself from the lifestyle. So that's the greatest thing to me is hip hop. Yeah. Hip hop has that, you know, flip the script flip on you. Script, you know, someone right. someone says a line to you, you flip it right back on them with a new meaning. Well, so hey, hip hop as like a whole lifestyle is like, oh, you put me in this in this environment, right. I'm gonna use that environment to get myself out of that environment. Well and we and it makes me think too we, we um we hear from a lot of in, in religion that you know, that comfort can be a problem because, you know, when it's easy you don't need God. But it's it's making me think on the notion that you know, when your circumstances are so bad, when your X is so bad, then to just settle in the X equals X, be miserable, you'd be in a horrible situation. So the circumstances, when X is bad, it pushes you to go X to Y, to kind of think of Y, or you'll just, you're just going to um, you know, consume yourself, you're going you're gonna to be lost. And it's almost as if, as of in Western society, or say America, precisely because the average standard of living is, is relatively good, that it's almost as if as economic comfort increases in the society, the forces to push people toward imagination are lost. Uh, there, there's less incentive to do it. People just stick, hey, the economy's working, so just get people to fit into the economy. X is X. Just All, all they need to do is know X is X. And this is why like 2008 was so devastating because people were going, X is X, X is X, X sucks, oh my gosh. You know, Suddenly they were going, we need a Y, but we don't have the imaginative capacity to get to Y. And I think you and your TED Talk also, that's what we, we're facing all this discrimination, xenophobia, what have you, and we're going, X is X, this is terrible, we need to move to Y, but then people don't have the capacity to move to Y. Well, I mean, one thing that I've come up with that has kind of helped me process the world and how people respond to me is I see it now as a lot of people have what I call external imagination. Ah. So obviously imagination is something that you create within yourself. It's in what we call it a uh, mind's eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, third eye, I think a lot of people, I think some people have more of a body's eye, if you will, you know, like when they look out in the world, the, the evidence of what they see to them is their version of imagination. It's right. almost like they can't see it until they see it. Right. Whereas the person who has worked on their imaginative muscle has said, you know, I'll see it and then make it into make reality. It to, make it to see. <laughs> yeah, I'll make it to see. So what's, what I think is happening is, you know, think of TV. Now we all have a bunch of screens on mm-hmm. our, you know, phones, iPads, laptops, even before TV. But now we have more images, more little square images mm-hmm. to look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just the images that your eye sees, it is every day informing you, literally yeah. inwardly forming, forming oh, that's you, great. informing you of not, what the world is. So if really you turn great. on the news every day and it's like, yep, stocks going down, world is getting worse, it's almost like you have no reason to believe anything else because yeah, your X is X. Yeah, you know, your external stock. imagination is telling external, you yeah. the truth. <laughs> right. But a person who has a very strong inner fortitude and has built that imagination knows they can resist mm. that. They know, even though images are coming in from the outside, there's a very strong internal truth that says, actually, I have a greater belief. It doesn't wow. mean it's going to be reality for everyone. Right. It doesn't mean that just because you believe this, that the world will be that way, but the world will be that way for you. Yeah, and it's, it's, maybe it's funny because it's like you say external and like the inner, the why. So it's like you go from the imagination, you go from your external to why, your why. So X to Y versus right. X to X. Uh, and yeah, and it, and it would just seem that if, if people do not cultivate imagination, then, then how can there be healing? Because, you, right. because healing is almost, because rationality will say that healing is, is denial. Right. If all you have is rationality, then healing is a joke. There is no healing. You know, healing exists, but it's not here. Uh, and so your so imagination. You almost it, it's almost like you could say that without imagination, you cannot escape the tyranny of rationality. Right. That you are stuck in the tyranny of rationality. You can't move beyond it. And 
Therefore, when the world is getting worse, or you have neo Nazis that are appearing in Charlottesville or different things like that, then you 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 can't move beyond it. You're now the tyranny of rationality will then <coughs> just make you stuck with the neo Nazis, and and it can only get worse. You know, right? You know, uh, externalities can get worse, but without imagination, it doesn't seem they can get better. Right. Uh, while imagination, it can get better. Well, I think also, I mean, we should probably do this topic as a whole another mm. podcast. Mm. But one thing that I like to talk about a lot is how imagination is sort of like the cousin of faith uh, or in the same family as faith. So uh, make believe, make believe, pretend, faith, imagination, curiosity, like all these things come together as a family that are sort of uh, seen as with cynicism these days. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. you have belief, right. you have faith. Right. Oh, you, you're going to pretend. Right. You know, these very childlike mm. uh, attributes and mm. traits that an adult embodies them. They're seen as, you know, who, who are you? Like, right. what's wrong? So I think when you think about faith, you know, what does faith say? You know, see it, you know, believe it, then see it. Uh-huh. You know, like speak it into reality. Yes. You walk by faith, yes. not by sight. So I think people also have this sort of disdain towards imagination because of how similar it looks right. to faith. Right. You're saying, I don't see this thing yet. Mm. You know, faith is the, the substance of things hoped hope for, the evidence right. of things yet. yet. Seen. Seen. So yeah. since it's yet, it hasn't happened yet, people dismiss it. They're like, well, where is it? Right. It's like, I don't see it. It's not empirical. Right. So if you're saying like, well, yeah, I'm in the process of being here. Like, no, if you went in someone right now in the rehab and you saw them like on their little thing where they have to walk, learn to walk again. Oh, I don't see you walking. It's like, I'm in the process of healing. That's hilarious. Like yeah. I'm yeah. in yeah. the midst of regaining myself back to wholeness and healing you don't mm. say the oh you're not walking yet so you're not mm. healed it's like i am healing ing so mm. faith imagination is an ing thing it's like it's on its way there on it's not way. it's not happening instantaneous per se but that i mean that's what healing is right it's a process well that well that's an interesting point you know that makes me think about kind of the idea that inspiring people heals them Right. You know, when they're kind of being inspired, in, inspiring as healing. And so the artist, to inspire people to work, so then you could say, like, art heals in inspiring because when it inspires people, it makes them move beyond X to Y, external to Y, uh, as opposed to just being stuck in what's immediately processed and, and, and circumstance, it, the circumstances. Well, I mean, and then there's the obvious connection of the word inspire, and it means to breathe in. So yeah. It's, it's a medical term itself that, uh, you know, that we right. use. Inspiration. Always good with that, Mr. Hankins, those word connections. Well, I, I did work for, uh, when I, you know, at work, I, got, I did this thing called the uh, standardized patient where we went in with med students. Oh, you and did? We, we yes, acted, that's right. We act as you know sick patients, and they have to practice on us. So we get to Man. rank them on empathy and bedside manner. So one time I was sitting there, and the, one of the first year students, she put her hand on my chest, and she was like, "Inspire," and I wanted to be like, "Would you like poetry?" Or this? <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't follow through with the joke because I, I didn't commit. <laughs> but yeah, it's just funny, like, because I talked about this in the podcast too. Of like, there's it's so interesting the medical terms that cross over with the art terms. Yeah. So they do this thing where they tap two fingers on your like abdomen and around your chest. It's called percussing because they can hear the acoustical oh, difference yeah. of where your organs are. And I mentioned to them, I said, oh, you know, like percussion, like a drum. And they were like, oh, I didn't even put those two together. <laughs> so it's just interesting how everything is disconnected. Like we don't see fair and fair is justice and beauty. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Percuss, percuss, inspire, inspire. We have, you know, that's why I say words are everything. Right. But to the inspiration point, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there is something healing about having a vision to look forward to that yeah. oh I can do that whether it's oh I can become president I can start my own business oh, yes. but in particularly healing I mean yeah all those other things obviously are important like if you're trying to start oh, a yeah. business if you've never seen someone do it before it's helpful to have a template so to oh, speak yeah. a vision but if you have someone who has been paralyzed or I won't say paralyzed if you have someone who's been in a bad car accident and you say oh that person will never walk again but that person somehow overcame yeah for you to see them do that for the first time, imagine a person sitting in hospital bed is like, they told that person they never walk again. They told me I'd never walk again. Right, right. So until someone is the first one to do it and be the visionary to create the imaginative t- blueprint, yeah. everyone else is kind of hopeless because they're like, well, all the evidence we have mm. is that people who get hurt can never walk again. But so- it takes somebody to say, like, actually, that's not always true. Right. No, and, I, you know... 
That said, though, I feel as if the cynicism in the modern world has entered new depths of uh, uh, in, in, in its operations against people's souls because it's even getting to the point now where when somebody overcomes and they learn to walk, they say, oh, well, that was that person, right. but not me. You know, even more X, you know, Sarah can walk again, but Daniel can't walk again, you know. Not, and, and so you further sort of wrap yourself up in a prison uh, to where overcome you can't you can't overcome and and then if you do overcome it doesn't mean anything it's it's just uh, bound up in that particular situation if all you have is rationality or imaging as you, as right. you're putting it then that's what you do you say oh Sarah got better but that's just Sarah where imagination goes if Sarah can get better why can't I you know there's right. this sort of movement to a, a bigger the imagination moves you to bigger visions where reasoning just keeps you in seeing. You know, you could say that uh, reason, left brain, to use that like left brain is seeing, right brain is visioning. You know, seeing and visioning. Right. And you're so, it seems as if we just have a society that's stuck in seeing, that um, can't move into vision, visioning, right. and then we wonder why nobody's healing. But because right. all anyone sees is wounds. Right. Well, I think what's important to talk about you know, because like I said, we're we're good at dissecting the problems, and then people are like, okay, so what's the answer? Right. Maybe we'll do a part two on yeah. that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think what I what I take away is is again about creating the language around this idea. So it's not that seeing is bad; it's just that your seeing with your physical eyes has a limitation mm. that it can only see. Right. I mean, sight. I mean, that's yeah, what right, it does. Yeah, like can hearing see. can only hear, <laughs> you know, smells, right. you know, smelling can only smell, touch can only touch. So it's not yeah. like people are wrong when they're like, oh, I don't, I don't I understand don't how I'm supposed to like sort of transcend to this other right. sixth sense. Like, yeah, I don't expect your physical eyes to see like healing. Right, right, right. In the sense that we're talking about. But I do expect yeah. your mind's eye. Yeah. Yeah, to see good. beyond the physical. That's yeah. that's what imagination is, or people call it the third eye. Yeah, the third like your imagination eye. is your third eye because it is what it allows you to see that which is not seen. Yeah, and I just feel as if we need to teach people that anything that says to you to stop imagining, you should be especially skeptical of. Right. Including skepticism. Like skepticism is always directed toward against imagination and, and art and different things like that. But precisely because that deconstructional skepticism will keep you in the X equals X per se, will keep you in the scene. Right. Knowing what that would mean for you, considering everything we're saying, that you'd be stuck in that, we, I think it is therefore rational to be skeptical of that. I think you can actually turn, you know, you're talking the hip hop. Well, I think you can actually turn rationality against its, um, exclus its own exclusivity on grounds of what the necessary outcome would be to you if you only stuck, stayed in the seeing, in the rational, and, and did not move to, to the vision. So there's almost something about the reason we kind of have gotten rid of imagination is because rationality has not been rational enough. You know, that seeing right. has not seen enough. It hasn't seen what it's done. <laughs> and Bro. so, you know, when you see what seeing, that pure seeing does, you would start to realize that you need to see something else. <laughs> you know, see right. something not there. Uh, so it, 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 it's interesting because... It's funny because people are so um, have become so anti-art and so anti-imagination on grounds of rationality. But in my mind, they're not being rational enough because if they actually were rational enough, that would lead them back to imagination because they would encounter the limits right. of rationality. Well, something I talked about, I started writing this thing, which I was I thought I was real close to finishing, and then I just stopped working on it. But I guess I'll come back to it. Right. But it's this idea of the practicality of imagination. Uh which I know that's probably hard for people to put those two words together. But I wanted especially creative people to realize that their imagination is the most practical tool that they have. Yeah. Because yeah. it allows you to take that thing which you are strongest at and practically implement it. So what yes. I mean is, for instance, okay, you're very nervous about going in for a job interview, right? Well, you have something at your disposal that most people see as silly. Your imagination. Right. You can set up an office in your house, get yeah, your yeah. friend to come over and say, hey, I'm going to play the boss. I'm going to play a real mean boss, too. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, like, overplay it, you know, to get you ready because it's probably not going to be this bad. But if we can practice getting your emotions ready, <laughs> you know, walk into the room, shake the hand, feel the sweat on your hand, sit down in a chair, have the resume in your hand, throw hard questions at you. Like, that's 
imaginative play, uh, practicing. I say play is practice for real life. Uh, so most people, they're terrified. Yeah. Job interviews, dates, why? Because they got to go in there the first time yeah, and do it in the yeah. moment. Not creative people. Right. Creative people is like, all oh, right, we've done this before. I've written stories. <laughs> I've written plays. Yeah, I've been yeah, in. Pl- yeah, yeah. I've been in plays. I've I've done poetry. Like I know what it's like to pretend. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I th- yeah. I take the word play pretend pre intend. Oh, interesting. Like pre. What are your pre intentions? Interesting. I intended to go in and land a job. Well, you need to pre intend and you need to practice the intending. Oh, well, that's quite lovely. I mean, because the artist seems habituated to unknowns, they're more comfortable with unknowns. And in fact, a lot of creative people don't like having set structures because then they feel limited. It's like they like to improvise. They don't like sheet music. Uh, and on the sheet music, you know, I was also thinking about you know seeing versus visions. On it's almost like society has sheet music. That it just looks at and like reads the notes, but doesn't make music. You right. know, without imagination, you 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 you're stuck on the sheet music, like reading the notes, but never making the music. And so that's like the society we have today. We're just kind of stuck. But but no, it, that's interesting because there is something about imagination that like you're ready for unknowns. You're ready for circumstances that right. uh, you kind of live a life of constant first times, perpetual first times. You know, all first story, first character, and taking risk. That's the other thing that creativity does. You're taking risks. You don't necessarily know how the story's going to work. You don't know if anyone's going to like it. You don't know if anyone's going to want to publish it or listen to it. There's a vulnerability. You're pouring your heart into something that you don't know anyone's going to want to receive. And so you're habituated to unknowns. You're habituated to risks. You're habituated to um, having confidence in yourself, building self-worth. And it. I struggle to imagine huh, uh, being able to heal oneself without these things. Right. So, yeah, I mean... Practical imagination means practicing your imagination. Mm. So I feel I'm like I'm living I'll, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, want yeah, like yeah, I yeah. want creative people and people who don't consider themselves creative to realize you have this imagination, which is free. Right, it's 100 <laughs> percent free. It's in your head. It's pre-installed. Right, came with came with you. Uh, you just need to update it. Mm. <laughs> Some people never updated it. Never you know maintained it. <laughs> um, and they got their software overwritten with the, the <laughs> right. logical school app. Right, right, um, right. But practical imagination means practicing your imagination daily. Mm. Not just sometimes, not just when hard times, daily. Right. So that means seeing yourself, an example of yourself. If you're overweight, like, yeah, it can be real hard to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, man, I'm going to get over this. Because you've just seen yourself right. for 20 years overweight. You're like, it's impossible. There's no right. way I'm going to be the healthy right. weight. Right. So the place you would have to start is in the mind. Right. Is by saying, okay, I'm going to like mentally imagine myself that way. And even draw it out. Like start drawing yourself. Uh, start like telling stories about yourself in the audio recorder. Right. You know, write a play. But the reason I say that is because you're going to practice your imagination either way. Because most of us do it. We wake up and we think negative thoughts about ourselves. Like, we imagine ourselves mm. getting rejected. Mm. We imagine ourselves going mm. up talking to that girl and her being like, no, never you. We right. imagine ourselves going, like, to the job and person be like, you're not good enough for this job. Right. So it's not really a matter of are you practicing your imagination. It's more a matter of are you practicing the positive image imagine. version self of your imagination. Yeah, because I was going to say on that point, it's kind of interesting because... E- the very act of, say, just getting up and going to the kitchen to get a cup of water requires some level of imagination, right. some level. So everyone is constantly practicing imagination. Just if you put one foot in front of the, 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 the next, you're moving from right. one external reality, reality configuration to another external reality configuration. But the issue is that it's so close to you, it's so constant right. in that form that you don't think of it as imagination. And so human beings are always operating in a kind of imagination. But the problem is they don't think of it as imagination, and also they're not using imagination in regard to things beyond the immediate. You know, right. they, they'll use it to connect immediate. <laughs> you know, they'll connect immediate moments, but they won't use it to connect something that's five years away. Right. You know, because that requires a, a you know the, this uh, long term imagination versus short term imagination. I mean, there's a lot more to it than this. I mean, there's like I always talk about self worth and identity right, right, and like. Right. Your experience is your story. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to get into, really get into this. But just as a general framework, the idea of, I see it as like pulling down a picture from the cloud. Like you Uh, need to, you need to, there's like a picture in the cloud that you need to download into your mind Mm. in order to have that thing to reference. 
Mm. Because when you go out into the world, the only reference points you have are the images you're shown. So uh. if the TV says, hey, you know, cancer is going up, and if you talk to your friends and we're like, yeah, man, cancer is an epidemic. Like, people right. are saying it, they're seeing it, they're yeah. reinforcing it. You listen to music, yeah, cancer killed my mom or whatever. Right. Like, you have all of these things that constantly reinforce a message that if you have no other internal message coming yep. from somewhere, you're empty, really, right. just to receive that message. Right. So at the very least... <laughs> You right. need some alternate message to house, to be housed in your mind to combat and be like, okay, like I'm not at the level yet where I'm like, yes, I believe cancer is going to be overcome necessarily, but you need to at least have some starting image. It's like, okay, that I don't have to like receive that, right. you know, that person, that was their story and that happened to that and that's happening, but it doesn't mean it has to happen to me. So that idea of like having your imagination connected to this cloud where there's an alternate Images, source possibly. of images yeah, 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 yeah. is important because otherwise you're going to be completely overtaken. You know, and it's interesting because that actually makes me think, you know, often you have objectivity over here, which is good, you know, closer to truth, objectivity, and subjectivity is bad. But what's kind of interesting is it's very possible that you're just happen to be surrounded by a hundred people whose mothers had cancer. Right. When you speak to every single one of them, you're going to conclude that everyone has cancer because right. your bubble does. And, you know, there's um, confirmation bias, uh, backdoor, fa- like all these different fallacies that occur that make people have certain views of the world that aren't there. Where it's almost like what you're getting at is actually the important role of subjectivity and imagination in order to check your rationality from falling into these logical fallacies. Uh, and, and that's quite curious because usually imagination would, is seen as sort of a corruption of objective understandings of right. the world. But really, in the examples that we're laying out, imagination would have a function of increasing objectivity or possibly increasing right. objectivity because it could help you move beyond a confirmation bias scenario, a group uh, groupthink scenario, to, to see bigger bigger pictures. Well, the two words that popped in my mind yesterday or the day before was objectivity and create. Activity. Activity. And so even though I talk about this stuff all the time, it had a new meaning. And I was like, okay, objects are created by creativity. Yes, you know, yes. Absolutely. Objects do not create creativity. Right, right. Creativity creates objectivity. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, is, it is a person who has the imaginative idea, which is transformed to an emotional and then physical creative action. Interesting. Creates an iPhone. A shovel, a car, whatever. Your mind has an idea, it's an image, becomes an action. That action becomes an object. Interesting. Creativity makes objects, but objects aren't creative. You know, so it goes. And so we, because we always put objectivity before subjectivity, right. and yet the very possibility of objectivity presupposes the existence of subjectivity. Well, it, I think we talk a lot about, you know, we have the essay um, collection in the essay called The Truism of the Rational, which is the idea that people assume, conflate the word rational and true, that if it is rational, it is true. Right. When, if you think it's going to rain today, it becomes rational to bring an umbrella. But let's say it doesn't rain today. Does that mean you were irrational? No, you were rational relative to what you thought was true. And so what constitutes rational is relative to what you believe is true, but since rationality has to come after truth, it can't be rationality of which picks truth. And so it has to be something like imagination or emotions or other faculties of ascension beyond rationality, and yet we act as if rationality is the only way to truth when we can't even define the rational without the truth to come beforehand. Right. And so I think, I think realizing that, once you get that the true isn't the rational, that suddenly imagination is extremely important. Uh, to, to even live a thoughtful life, uh, to even live a, a life that has a logic to it. I mean, we've, we've so much put the terms of logic and rationality over here and imagination and creativity over there when you can't, you can't have logic and rationality without creativity and imagination. Well, I mean, as I said, you know, creativity creates objectivity or creativity creates objects. So from my mind, I create an object the iPhone is now a thing, right? Mm. And so then that iPhone can allow me to be more creative sure. right, in right. ways that I wasn't before, but that literal, right. tangible itself. object itself is not going to just then create other iPhones. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or, you know, make... It, literally, it's not going to make anything. Right, exactly. I, again, using my creativity, channeling it through that iPhone, that computer, 
that instrument, whatever object I create can only be creative through my creativity. Yeah, and that reminds me, I think, of John Seale, the, the great mind philosopher, you know, he was talking about how people always say, well, the brain is, you know, it's, it's like a computer. It's just like a computer. It's nothing right. special. But he says that you don't find, he reminds everyone that you don't find computers in nature. Right. That, you you know, if you say that the mind is like the computer, then you're saying the mind is like something the mind made. So you can't just reduce the functionality to being like a computer and thus nothing special in nature because there's no computers in nature. And so likewise, when people like reduce creativity uh, to just being nothing special, the very possibility of envisioning uh, imagination as nothing special requires imagination to envision. You have to have imagination or in order to imagine imagination not mattering. <laughs> right. you know? And I think something I like to try to do, even though it's sad or in this place, it's been kind of fun to like try to explain creativity, imagination, in ways that people can grasp, like I said, the practicality of imagination or like practicality of creativity. So if you really broke it down to someone who was like, no, you know, uh, we need to focus on more like left brain tasks. I was like, well, you do realize like when you go into surgery as a doctor, you're being creative in the sense of, like, you're creating new connections between, like, veins yeah, that yeah. weren't there. Mm. Or, like, no no one just goes into surgery not looking at an image. Mm. You know, no one goes into surgery and doesn't draw on the x-ray chart. Say, we're going to connect this valve. And, like, you're, you're doing a, like, an architect would do a blueprint. Mm. Here's the image that is. Mm. And then here's what we're, how we're changing the image. Now, mm. they're doing it with their hand on a chart. So, it's obviously more visibly present to the eye for people to go like oh yeah, yeah blah 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 yeah. but you know the creator can do that in their mind and say like they can look at something and go like yep and uh, yeah, I'm gonna draw that and I'm gonna draw that and I'm gonna draw that and then I'm gonna draw okay now I'll draw it it's like the creative person draws in their mind first and then with their hand so it's seen as less valid because like right. oh we didn't see you do it so we can't really trust that it's true right and you know and to bring it back to the, the, the you know the podcast on art as healing Obviously, the podcast when saying art is healing, it was not talking about art as uh, medicine healing or right. medical healing. Right. It was talking about spiritual healing, mental healing, um, you know, uh, social society healing. You know, these right. sort of more metaphysical sorts of healing. Well, based on everything that we've said, I mean, it's not just that art as healing. Imagine, you know, if we take art and take the step from art to imagination, it's not just imagination as healing. It, it's imagination is right. healing it right. equals right. healing right. and i think precisely because we view i think we view imagination as a way to healing that is the imperative there to stress it and to cultivate it and to make it um a skill that everyone has is not there as much right. as if you realize that imagination is healing well, then suddenly you have no choice if you want society to be healed if people to be healed people to have strong mental health etc so forth right. you have no choice but to teach and cultivate imagination. And perhaps that's part of the problem that we need to move from thinking in terms of imagination as healing to realizing that imagination is healing. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, we did have a neuroscientist, but she, I mean, she talked about music and stuff that she yeah, yeah, did yeah, with yeah, some, yeah, yeah. like... Oh, and then certainly there's research yeah. that art can have medical, right. you know, the, the Alzheimer with the music and different. I'm not saying yeah. that it is not, but when we're talking about this sort of social healing, right. we're going in that sort of direction. We really need to think of imagination, not just as healing, right. but being healing, is healing. Right. Um, yeah, she did some work with, like, people in Haiti and music and trauma. I forgot all the stuff she said, but she before, before the podcast, she was talking about, you know, how brain when playing music like it lights up your brain like yeah. in ways yeah, yeah, that yeah. nothing else does which is very interesting so we got into that um but uh, to your point on like imagination is healing it's like okay well why is that so it's like okay well we live this is where we this is why i love this intersection where art meets philosophy because mm. now we're talking about art is healing and then you bring in the philosophical link which is right philosophy helps you deal with things like death right what is death why is there death? Yeah, exactly. Like, how do we cope with it? How do we accept it? How do we engage it? So, as a philosopher, I have to ask questions of like, okay, when something dies, how do I process that? Because my mind says, that thing which was there is no longer there. I mean, it's one thing to look at a building fall. Right. Like, I told my mom, like, recently when I went back home, 
I went to the church that I grew up in and it just wasn't there. Right. Like I looked at the plot of land right. and I'm like, this thing, you, I could see where the steps used to be, where I go on Sunday, the brick and the right. iron rails and the two doors. It's just grass. Right. And my mind is sitting there trying to say like, how does this thing, a building that was there for 30, probably more years, is now just not there? Yeah, just gone. It just doesn't, does, does my time there mean nothing? But right. me growing up in that church have no significance anymore because right. that building is gone. Right. I can't walk spatially inside right. of it anymore. Right. I have pictures of it right. and pictures in my mind. Imagine that with a human. Right. Because we, um, I don't know if not everyone's been to a funeral, but if you've been to a funeral you, or a right. visitation, you looked in the casket and you just stare at that body and you right. just go like, that person is there, but they're not, not there. there. Yeah. You're right. looking at the body and you're just sure. like, get up, just get, get up, but get up. You're, you're in your, your brain is yelling at this body. Wake up. Why are you not awake? Right. So your mind in that moment is trying to reconcile the fact that you just saw this person. That's yeah. why I, I just saw them. Yeah. I just talked to them. I right. just, I just, I we were, I and it was, there's this understanding of like, this thing was true right. and real and alive. Now I can't even right. one word, nothing. Right. So how does your mind deal with that? Your mind has to reconcile this thing was here. Now there's emptiness. So what's going to fill its space? Building, you can build another building. Mm. You know, same blueprint. Right. Materials make it look just like it is. I mean, people were talking about that with 9-11. They're like, right. should we rebuild the towers? Right. Should we do the twin towers again? There's a tower there now. So they've rebuilt something. It's not the same. Right. But it's something where people go like, okay, yeah, that's kind of a you know remnant, yeah, reminiscent yeah, yeah, of yeah, the yeah. skyscraper. But when you lose a human being in your life who you who meant yeah. something to you yeah. voice eye color memories right. their laugh their sense of humor right. things gifts they gave you when you lose that unique presence in your life your mind doesn't know what to do with right. it right at the very least right. i'm not saying it's going to be total healing but at the very least your imagination can step in and say hey look my greatest strength is i'm able to puts a placeholder of sorts in that empty space mm. you know project an image a memory a song mm. you know something that right. gives a sort of comfort yeah and so yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah, not yeah. it's not i'm not obviously imagination is not going to be the end all be all but what i'm saying is for issues that deep right. and that meaningful imagination has to be the is healing that you're talking about. No, that that's extremely good, and and I think perhaps another discussion that we can have soon is on that interesting connection between philosophy and art, of which, since art comes out of imagination, and imagination and philosophy both entail abstraction, this act of abstraction that like putting them together seems to be training the brain to do what it needs to do to heal. Because exactly on what you're saying, once somebody dies, once someone's gone, if you don't have imagination, then you're stuck just looking at the body of the, the loss, the nothing, and you have to, to dwell in that place. Um, well, well, Mr. Hankins, it was always a pleasure and delight to speak to you. I, I think um, just this really getting people to understand that imagination is at the very center of the question of healing um, is, is just very, very important because if we don't, then we can't heal. We're stuck looking at the, at the wounds, X is X. So we, we are grateful for the work you've done on the subject. Uh, with, with your participation in the podcast and on the panel and what you've said. And we certainly greatly look forward to our next discussion. Uh, it is always a pleasure and an honor, Mr. Hankins. Thank you.